Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, thanks. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo Podcast, part of the Blue Air Network. I am your host, Patrick Moran. Thank you for locking in. Video side, audio side, it is Tuesday. Now, typically, that would mean Joe Yerden would be with me, but Joe is swamped up with work. So my good friend, Chad D. Dominicis from Expected Buffalo is kind enough to tag in for Joe. What's going on, buddy? How you doing, man? Been a while. Yeah, it's been a little bit. I'm good. How are you? Doing pretty good. Um, we're going to talk some bills. We're going to talk some savers, naturally. Um, I saw on your Twitter, because I didn't talk to you in a little bit either, but I saw yeah. on your Twitter that you went for the first time to uh, a Buffalo Bills home playoff game anyway. Yes. Uh, let's kind of start there, because, man, I have not been to a game for a long time, quite frankly. And for the most part, I'm going to be honest with you, Chad, I don't really like going to games. I'd rather watch <laughs> them at home on TV, comfortable on my couch, Yeah, you know, listen to the guys, get up, go to the bathroom when I want, eat when I want, all that other stuff. But it, lately, everything has been going on with, with, with the Bills. I, I kind of have been a little bit envious of the crowd. Obviously, uh, the New England home or regular season finale last week, coming off the heels of everything that happened with DeMar Hamlin, just that crowd, that energy was just, uh, even through the television say, you could just feel the electricity. And I would imagine being a, a playoff game, uh, kind of more of the same. Like, just talk about your experience, you know, going to the game, what it was like at the stadium, all that stuff. Yeah, it definitely had that different vibe to it. I, mean, I think for a few things. One, it was super sunny um, in January, which is rare around here. Yeah. Uh, so that was a little bit different, you know, walking around in, in sunglasses and having sunglasses during the entire game. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you could feel it um, just walking through the parking lot, um, being in the stadium. Now, I think it wasn't as energized. Um you know, because I think if Tua was playing, maybe it was a little bit different energy to it. It felt like more of a kind of a party, a laid back, you know, atmosphere because, hey, we're in the playoffs. This is awesome. This is good. You know, we're going to be loud and crazy, but, you know, we're, we're going to win this game by a lot. Like, come on, they're playing Skylar Thompson. Like, let, let, Let's go have fun. Everyone's being nice to Dolphins fans. Like, oh, good luck. You know, hope it's not too bad for you guys. You know, and they're laughing. I'm like, oh, yeah, hopefully it's not. You're not killing us or anything. So. You know, it was funny to kind of hear from Dolphins fans. That they were in a good mood, too, not that contested. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that was a tailgate scene. And then, you know, once you get in there, it it the electricity starts right away. So, I mean, you're you're into it from that opening drive. Um, you know, I, di I didn't think I was yelling too much and too loud until halftime. Uh, you know, we walked out kind of we were on the shaded side. So, you know, our feet were getting cold. So we walked out at halftime, went to the sun and up the steps. We were in the 100 level. Uh and then I was trying to talk to my wife I went to the game with and like my voice wasn't coming out. I was like, like, I think I lost my voice already. It's like the first. <laughs> 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 so I kind of wasn't expecting that, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of roller coasters in that game. Um, super excited. A lot of high energy. You're up by 17. You're like, Oh my God, we're going to win by 50. And then all of a sudden you go to the half and it's 20 to 17. You're like, what just happened? And then the fumble out of right out of the half too, and then you're losing, and you're like, oh my, oh my god, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of roller coasters, a classic Bills game in the sense. In the last few weeks, that's kind of how it's been. A lot of ups and downs, and how this team's pretty much been since like week four, and they stopped blowing teams out, and every game's been a tight one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had a good time. It was fun. It was my first playoff game ever. Um, like you, I used to. I, I don't go to games that much. I used to be season ticket holder. Uh, for years, uh, right before they got good, of course, I gave them up. But, uh, you know, I only went to one game this year, and I went to the Minnesota game, actually. Um, so I had, oh, that bad, I had that bad vibe energy. So my wife, because she went with me to that game, too, uh, when we were, like, deciding what we're wearing, I, I made clear to her, we're not going to wear anything that we wore to that Minnesota game. Gloves, hat, jersey. <laughs> like, we're not bringing any bad vibes with us. So it worked out, but uh, it was it was nervous for a little bit. Now, for you personally, because, you know, you, you cover primarily hockey and I feel like and maybe I'm wrong, but with, with you, the Sabres is different. I feel like you cover the team. Yeah, you cover the team, you know, right. yeah. more as a reporter. So you, at least you have somewhat of an objective view 
when you're watching Sabre games because you're, like I said, you're doing work concerning how they're playing, whether it's sitting in the press box, which you've done plenty of, or whether it's sitting in the stands, because I'm even in the stands for a lot of games yep. as well. Either way, you, is it like when you go to a Bills game, you kind of just be 100% a fan oh, and yeah. get to let loose, you know, you yep. don't have to worry about, yep. you know, what are people going to think? Or am I being a homer? Am I being, yep. am I not being objective? That's a pretty nice uh, feeling to be able to just let loose and 100% be a fan, ain't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've had people say, like, you know, why don't you talk? I mean, because I mean, we've even talked about it, like, you know, you should do more bill stuff and yeah, and talk about the bills. And I'm like, no, like that's hockey is my thing. I cover. I just want to be a fan. Like, of course, I have my comments and my opinions on the team, but like, I'm no that that for me is just a fan. If we ever add like bills content to our site, it'll be by somebody else that just and then they just cover the bills. That's still not going to be me. It's you know, I've done more studying, especially for being a numbers guy. Like the last two two years, I spent a lot of time understanding the numbers and getting in because that's my thing, right? So that's kind of what sure. I want to understand when I'm watching the game and looking into stuff and, and all the DVOA and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm a fan, and that's never going to change. Uh, I I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna say that I'm not a Sabres fan anymore, but it's different than how it was, you know, right? 12, 15 years ago when I was a season ticket holder during 05, 06, 06, 07, and in those years. Uh, and, and you know, being into it, it's, it's a little bit of a different vibe now. Uh, I tell people the press box has taken a lot out of me. Um, big game, meaningless game, it's rare that I'll ever get any reaction out of a goal. You know, it's kind of just it, it, it's taking me out a little bit. It's not that I don't get excited on a nice play or you know, get you know, happy if they win. It's just the work has separated the emotion yeah. a little bit for yes. you when, when it comes yeah. to uh, the Sabres. You talked about running into some Miami fans at the game and it. Did it, it kind of felt like they were playing with house money? Like they it's were just not, oh yeah. happy to be yep. now had the guy had two have been healthy, had some of the other guys had most have been playing, and it might it probably would have been a different vibe from Miami fans with expectations. Yeah. But yeah, you definitely got a sense that it was just like, yeah, we got nothing to lose here. Let's just let's just have some fun. Yeah, I mean, they were walking around. I mean, it's I there's a couple handful of fans that Dolphins fans I talked to where you're standing in line and you're just talking to a Dolphins fan. Um there was one, there's a couple at a tailgate that I stopped at, you know, because we made a couple stops around. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and the same thing, you know, they were, you know, there was everyone was just laughing, kind of tailgating together, like, ah, this is this is gonna be fun. They were like, Oh, I bet you guys are cold. Like, you know, like that's really yeah, like nothing really about the game. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm sure throughout the game the dynamic maybe changed a little bit for people who were sitting next to Dolphins fans, you know, when they got ahead and sure uh all that good stuff. But uh you, know, you run into that Nikki Smokes dude at all? No, no, no. I mean, I, you know what? I, I'm glad he had a good time here. I mean, that's cool to see, though, right? It is. I mean, you, you know, it, it really is, Chad. And I'll tell you, man, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I thought the kid was a young man, whatever you want to call him, was a kind of a, a real douchebag. Yeah. I mean, you go back to early in the year and Miami beat Buffalo. And during that game, the Bills were very injury ravaged. And uh, he talked a lot of shit. In fact, if you're watching this on the YouTube side, by the way, if you are, Make sure you subscribe at that like button. It helps with our algorithm. But anyway, I saved this screenshot going back to September 25th. <laughs> so if you're watching this on the YouTube side, it's immediately after the game when the Bills lost to Miami, literally in the final seconds. And uh, the guy, and, and again, his, his handle is at Nikki Smokes. He tweeted out a picture of Josh Allen, just who was mentally and physically exhausted from playing in that heat, man. I mean, he carried a team as far as they can go. And yeah. two was kind of hugging him and consoling him. And the caption that he wrote was second place is okay, man. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, man, times have uh, have really changed. But to your point, the guy really, uh, he embraced it. I, he knew what was coming with all the injuries and stuff. He he knew what was ahead of him, but he had fun with it. He came to Buffalo this weekend. He went to some wing spots, Bar Bill, of course. I, I think he went to Gabe's Gate, overrated Gabe's Gate, but whatever, that's another discussion. Yeah. For another time, he had a lot of fun with him, man. He Bandits a, game, I saw he was at the Sabres yeah, game today, too. Sabres so. game today, he uh, yeah, he certainly got his shit in. He, his, yeah, he hit it all, right? He hit all the stuff, right? He you went to I mean? a table. Good for, good for him. He was a good sport, and, and I'm really glad that and I'm sure there were a couple of hecklers who might have said dumb shit to him. You always get those when you get enough I mean, the way around. I put it to people, like, think about 10 years back when the bills were who they were you know losing all those times mm -hmm. if you had a game where the bills are playing the patriots 
injury ravaged Patriots team or not, if that same thing happens, roles reversed, how many stupid videos do we have up oh, there? Sure. Like, right? Like, it's it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. Gotta, I don't... Have a little I don't perspective hate on in the it. Kid. He's, had, no. he's a fan. He's having fun having with fun, the team. He's excited, and you know, right? And he was, oh yeah, he was. I mean, he was a little overexcited for that yeah. game, a regular season game. But hey, to your point, right? He's got every right to be in. And to yeah. his credit, he kind of owned it. He owned and, it, and, and he came yeah. up and he had a lot of fun. And he did a lot of Buffalo stuff, and yeah, you know, for the most part, fans were great to him. He went through a table, and like I said, he's just. Uh, I'm sure he's got a. A much better perspective on on the city sure. of Buffalo, so that part was pretty cool. You know, another thing too, you want to talk about a? Uh, were you overconfident going into this game? Would you say if you weren't? Most people certainly were. Were yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I was overconfident in the sense that if they lost, um, the way I put it to somebody that said my goodbyes to my children, if they lose this game, I'm not going home. Like that's like <laughs> <laughs> I just. I wouldn't be able to live with it. Like I, it would have broke me. I don't know. It would have been lose that game ugh. with that situation. The expectations of this team just no. Like I, I yeah, that's I, my sense of work. I mean, I understand the playoffs. You never know what happens. I mean, like look right. at the Bengals game too. Honestly, the Bengals probably should have lost that game. Absolutely. They got pretty lucky. We can say the same thing about the bills too. I mean, there's absolutely one or two plays in there. A couple of drop passes by the dolphins receivers. And, you know, that, that's a completely different game. So, uh, no, yeah. There's no question about it. I, I'll tell you, and I, I said I said this on the show yesterday, I said all the things all week long. I, I wrote all the things on social media all week long. You know, anything could happen in the NFL, but there was never a second in my life where I even contemplated having to come on and do this podcast following the Bills' wild card loss to Miami. It would have been, without question for me, not the worst loss in the in the history of the franchise because that'll always be the Super Bowl, you know, the yeah, yeah. 2019 game that they lose wide right, or even last year, 13 seconds. It probably would have been the most embarrassing loss, though, in the history of the franchise. Had oh, they you would have heard about it for months. To a the entire summer, you would have heard about it. It would have been the worst offseason ever. But like I said, I said and wrote all the right things, but I was overconfident in how you I'll tell you a true sign of how overconfident I was coming into this game. Reports started to triculate on Saturday. Matt Milano posted, I believe, on his Instagram that DeMar Hamlin was at the facility hanging out with yeah. some of the guys. Yeah. And there were reports that were starting to leak, or rumors, I should say, not reports, that uh, DeMar Hamlin was going to be out of the field with the team. And I told myself, and I said to anybody who would listen, I said, no, 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 no. Don't do that this week. Save, Save that shit for next week. <laughs> They're probably playing the Bengals or whoever, even if it was Jacksonville. Yeah. Next round, save it for the next round. You know, yeah. I didn't want them to quote unquote waste Tamar Hamlin being back on the field for the first time with his team yeah. just because the roof, proverbial roof, literally would have came off the place even more so than last week when they played New England. Like I said, though, turns out that they almost didn't have another game after that. Yeah. It was just, uh, yeah. it was crazy. Let's, uh, so I got three things that I think were the best things about the game, three things my takeaways that were the worst. I, I kind of want to okay. go over these with you, get your thoughts on them. Maybe you might have one or two of your own as well. Uh, we'll start with the best three things. And these aren't necessarily in specific order from one to three. They're just three things that I thought were among the best. Um, One playoff Gabe Davis is back. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was really, really big. Yep. He has had, and I've been like, you know, one of the founding fathers of the Gabe Davis fan club on Buffalo Twitter going back well before last year's playoff explosion against the Chiefs where he had four tutties and 201 yards receiving. But anyway, it's been tough to defend him this year. I'm talking about as a fan, defending him from criticism. Yeah. Um, the numbers were so-so. It's just, I mean, he had one or two great games, a Pittsburgh game, but he was just really inconsistent all year. Issue with drops. Um, route running didn't look great at times. Almost looked lazy, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. I know he had an ankle or foot injury early in the year, and I think maybe that mentally messed with his mind. I don't know what it was, but he just didn't have the type of year that we thought he was going to build off of on last year. So coming into this playoffs, a lot of worries, but this was a really positive sign. Six catches, 113 yards, and a For touchdown, sure. a really nice touchdown to uh, you know, just talk about Gabe Davis and, and how important he is to this office, especially – in the second half where Stephon Diggs has literally one target over the last 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, it was good to see, um, you know, like you, I've, you know, maybe not like you, but I, I've been kind of hard on him this season. Um, yeah. 
a lot of too many drops, um, too many balls hit him in the chest. I, I always, even going back to last year, I always thought the way he catches the ball is just, is just weird. It's weird for a receiver, I think, to get to where he got to the way he catches because like he he smacks at the ball. Like you see a lot of receivers that uh, receive it where he like attacks the ball and smack. It's, it's weird, mm-hmm. but whatever. It works for him. It's his thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was good to see that. Um, you know, funny thing. I, I, the one, I think what's early in the game, the one that got reviewed where he got his hand under it. Uh, you know, I said to the people around me, I said, he doesn't make a lot of catches. So give him that one. Cause he caught that one. So, uh, early in the game, I was still on him, but you know, as the game went along, <laughs> uh, it, it was kind of good for him to get that. And then, you know, it, yeah. It opens up your offense too, for sure. Yeah. Um, and other things going, we'll go to uh, the other side of the ball. Linebackers, Matt Milano, Tremaine Edmonds, both excellent. Matt Milano had 10 tackles, two sacks. He had one whiff tackle on a fourth down. It was really, you know, frustrating. That was to annoying. Watch. Yep. Yep. That was really annoying on fourth down too. But yep. that said, Matt Milano was an animal, man. He was making plays all over the place. And I'll tell you, and you know this as well as anybody, Tremaine Edmonds, one of those polarizing figures on the Bills. Fans love him when they want to get this guy out of town. I thought he was excellent. I I mean, this guy was just flying to the football. He was aggressive. He's been more aggressive this year than I've ever seen him by far, too. But uh, like I said, really good in pass coverage. The Bills have success on defense only having two linebackers because it's these two guys. and. You know, I think Allen obviously is the first and maybe digs after that. You can make a fair case that Milano and Edmonds are the two guys after that that they can afford to lose the least. Well, maybe Jordan Poyer too, because of who's yeah. back there now. But right. man, just talk about these guys because I man, they were they were playmakers on Sunday and it made a big, big, big difference. Yeah, I mean, for me, really it's it's more Edmonds and Milano. I've always been a Milano fan, and you know, he's always flashed and done really nice things. Mm-hmm. Uh but going into this season, I was not an Edmonds fan. Um, but I will admit fully that this has been the best season of his career. He has yeah. been great from week one, right on through. I've had a problem with him at any week, honestly, this season. Uh, and yeah, he was good again. So that's great. That's awesome. Um, it's good for the bills. I think it's helped their defense a lot. I think in the games he didn't play, uh, you could definitely tell he was an important piece to not have out there. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, well, it's it's a conversation for another day, but still worth mentioning that I think his play this season makes the conversation around his contract more interesting. Sure, because going into this season, I had no desire to give him any type of money, uh, and then now with how this season's gone, it's well, and you know, there's nothing really behind him, and you know, so it could be tough to let him go. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, another day conversation, but yeah, right. full marks to Edmonds for what he's done. Great season. Uh, you know, hopefully he keeps it up here over the next two weeks because they're definitely going to need him against definitely against uh, Cincinnati and most likely Kansas city. So hopefully these two keep, keep rolling. I'm really glad you said that too, because I, I've gotten a lot of comments, you know, they, they signed him in a long term and they're going to franchise tag him. I just look, man, you're in the midst of a playoff run. How about you enjoy that and worry yeah. about what's going to happen in the future with Jermaine in February yeah. when the time comes. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. a good, you know, four weeks from now. Yep. Um, and then one other thing. And again, there was more than just three, but another thing was, uh, I thought the secondary made a lot of plays on the football. Like they got beat a couple times. And I mean, Miami did have a couple drops too. And Waddle definitely had one. Yeah. He had maybe his game. worst game of the season. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But there were also, when you, when you look at replays, like there was another play and I'm not talking about the early drop that Waddle had, but Waddle had a step on, on white and it looked like he was about to come down with it. And you seen Trey white, get his hand on the ball, yep, close that and gap, knock yep. it away, close the gap. Teron Johnson had another play like that. Um, and and then Kyer Elam, I mean, what a hell of a game this kid had. He went from being a guy who was a first round, first year bust. Not gonna call the kid a bust for his career, but mm. a first year bust for being a first rounder. He went from being that to a big reason why the Buffalo Bills had got a football game to play this Sunday against Cincinnati because he had an interception in the second half when they needed it. Miami was up four at the time, and uh, who knows what happens if he doesn't make that play. He picks it off. The Bills score a touchdown, and it was a tight game, obviously, the rest of the way. But that was a big play. Nearly had a second interception. And then at the end of the game, on Miami's last drive, it was fourth and five, trying to throw yeah. a pass to Gusecki. And speaking of getting a hand on the ball, they knock it away. Elon made a beautiful play, knocked the ball out, and then the Bills were able to run the clock out. So the secondary, make it, D. Marlowe had an interception. 
So and and they had two hundred. And like I said, Elam made one. So they had two picks as a secondary. The secondary made plays on the football, and I thought that was really big. Specifically, uh, Kyler Elam far and away had his best game as a Bill in what was obviously the most important game in the year. Yeah, to go back to that Elam interception, I, I want to say, and I'm still sitting here kind of surprised about it. I think it was like third and sixteen too, or something like that. Yeah, it was. He said Miami was up. I cannot believe they let Thompson throw the ball in that play. Yeah. There was no reason for it. They did yeah. the only thing the like that was almost like the only thing that could happen. Like that was the worst case scenario, like that you could the Bills couldn't move the ball on you. They were having a bunch of trouble offensively, and you gifted them. Like trying to get a third and sixteen with your third string quarterback when just like like that's one you just hand it off and you you punt it and you make the Bills driving Agreed. and they haven't been able to do. So that was you know, great play by Elam, but still, I cannot believe McDaniel let him throw the ball there. That that was crazy to me. Uh, but yeah, I, though the Elam thing, like, I never really understood it. Uh, I understand there are some, you know, plays in the season that weren't great. Uh, but, like, the underlying numbers, too, like, on him are always good. Um, and he, whenever he plays, he looks like he's fine. I don't, I just... It's like Dane Jackson's been playing so well that you can't take it from him. So I never really understood the Elam thing. Uh, I hope he plays next week. You know, I, I even if Jackson's healthy, like I, I don't know, man. You like playoffs? So like, we're we're gonna play the hot hand here. I mean, like he's he's the better of the two. It's been a couple weeks now where he's gotten in and he's been the better of the two players. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're gonna get Christian Benford back. You know, well, he is back. So is I mean, back. you know, so. Yeah. You know, it comes down to Jackson playing probably yeah, if right. he sees the field or not. Yeah, I yep. think Elam's got to start going forward. And, uh, yeah, I thought that was, in fact, I would make it a fair case that that might have been the play of the game. I agree with you, by the way. It was a horrible mistake by Miami. Yeah, But that interception led to Buffalo scoring what would become two straight touchdowns on offense. Kind of it reignited the offense for at least for a little while anyway. It put but, the crowd back in the game, too, because it was absolutely. super quiet there. Sure. Well, you would know better than me because <laughs> you were there. Did you sense, by the way, was there any point, like, let's just say, I'm um, kind of getting a little bit off topic, but I, I do want to pick your brain a little bit because you were at the game. All right, so you start out like a ball of fire. We're going to roll this team. They're ready to run for the bus. Oh, shit, we're making some mistakes. More on that in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll talk about that. But you go into the half, and you're up. All right, what the Bills were up three, I believe, at the half. Didn't 2017, yeah. Yeah, so they're up three at the half. Miami gets the ball. You stop them. The Bills get the ball, and you're like, all right, man. I, I would assume the energy in the crowd is like, all right, let, let's go. Let's put a drive together, get up two scores, and let's roll. But then, of course, Josh Allen strip sack, fumble, bam, touchdown. Shock, obviously. Did you get a sense that there was, like, some panic on the Bills, some, some panic in the crowd at that point? Yeah, I, I don't want to say panic, but I think some, I think the uh oh settled in or kind of started to come in. Uh, it was after the fumble series. Then the Bills obviously got the ball back. And I'm pretty sure they went three and out again or maybe got one first on and punted. And that's yeah. when you're kind of like, the, oh God. Like, you know, they kind of, you're putting it back to Miami. And then, like, it's, yeah, they haven't moved the ball the entire game. So that's on your mind. But it's also like, they have Hill and Waddle and it takes one pass and they're gone. And then you're down. What at that point you're down for 10 or 11, you would have been. And you're the go coverage. And now we're chasing the game. And yeah, I, I think it was after that drive that again, like I said, it, it started to get quiet. You felt the nervousness pick up. The fans were not in the game and yeah, that interception put the crowd right back in the game. And you know, yeah, it, it, it really was big. And the defense as a whole in the third quarter came up big. They had two straight three and outs and then the interception yep. um, by Elam. And one other thing, I want to circle back to your point that you talked about Miami. You can't believe that Skylar Thompson threw that pass, which I completely agree with you. But that was kind of their like their their model all day was just let's be really, really aggressive and take chances. I mean, Skylar Thompson threw the ball down the field a lot. There were plays out there that could have been 51 made. times overall. It's insane. Yeah. And like, and, and on the other side of the ball, they just said, F it, man, we are going to blitz Josh almost every play. And if he could beat us with the deep ball, then take your head off to him. And he did once yeah. or twice, but uh, and Miami was just super aggressive and they were playing like a team. I thought like that, you know, that had uh, nothing to lose. Anyway, I want to take a real quick break. Come back on the other side. We'll go over a couple things that, uh, we're not good from this game. And then we'll spend a few minutes as well talking about the Buffalo Sabres, who, by the way, 
Monday. We're taping this Monday night. Not a good Monday afternoon for the Savers. Be right back. All right, I'm back with Chad D. Domenicis. All right, so a couple things on the bad side. And again, I'm not uncovering any rocks here by telling you about this, but the turnovers, I mean, that's a killer. They're always a great equalizer. That's what will make a superior team and an inferior team end up having a close game where anything can happen. Josh Allen throws two, two interceptions. One of them clearly his fault. Terrible decision and throw down the field to Brown. Other yeah, one there was, was there off. was no reason for that. You're in control of that game. Like. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and then the other one goes off Cole Beasley late in the second quarter, and that's picked. And then, of course, the fumble um, when he got sacked. Never saw the guy coming. I really don't know how much you could put that on Josh Allen for that specifically. But anyway, three turnovers, um, just two terrible drops. Quite well. Dawson Knox wasn't really quite a terrible drop. The, the one in the end zone that he didn't get his hand completely under, that was not an easy play. But he came down with the ball, though. He should have He should have caught it. Yeah. And then Khalil Shakir, I mean, that yeah, I mean, was a – You got to catch that ball. And that's – 51-yard pass. And they're up – and I, I remember it, too. They were up 17-6 to six at the time. Yep. Khalil comes down with that ball at worst is 20-6, to six, likely 24-6, to six, late in the quarter. And – uh Kill the momentum you know, for Miami because that was a third down play, right? And they had a, they had a punt after that. Yeah, they, they ended yeah. up punting. No, no, that that might I think that might have been the drive where Beasley the the interception happened on that same drive. I believe oh, so. Maybe it was, maybe or, it was. or they punted. It was one or the other, but I know yeah. it stopped them from getting points. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was the interception play. Or it might have been. Yep. Because yep. it went from being I I remember saying I was because I was screaming at my TV at this point. Yep. The calmness was gone from Pat Moran. <laughs> it went from being like I said a three score game, maybe even a close to a four score game to be in a, you know, a one score game, just like that. Just those things can't happen. And also in the first half special teams, they had a lot of 50 yard punt return that led to a field goal too. So yeah, that was the worst thing about the game. It's just like, and this has been a theme with the bills. We know this all season long. Um, they go in, they dominate games, but they're their own worst enemy. And that was absolutely the case with Miami. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like I said, that, that first interception, there's just, I, apparently, people said that Romo said on the broadcast that he cut his that Brown cut his rod out. I don't think so. Yeah. I was just it was a, he was never open. The second right. he let go of the ball, I I, I know I, I saw it. Like the second he let go of the ball, I looked where he was throwing and I, I started yelling no out loud because he was an open. Um, now you can say maybe Brown's got to do a better job locating the ball and fighting for that ball. Fine, yeah, okay, um, but I don't think it was a bad route. I just you know, yeah, I the thing like. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the person who's gonna get on Ken Dorsey, uh, but when they lined up, kind of in a heavy package on that play, I said to my wife, "I said play action pass downfield." It's just. I. I just. It. You could just tell that's what they were doing. They had Max protect. They had him on the field as the only receiver. I think maybe even. Uh, and yeah, sure enough, that was the play that came out. So like, if I saw it in the stands, I'm pretty sure Miami had a good idea what was coming. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, then that first one is kind of inexcusable for me. But it's it's you know it's Josh. He's going to have those plays fine. Uh, the second one, you know, bounces off of Beasley's chest. What are you going to do? That's bad luck. Uh, and then the fumble, you know, again, you're, you're, it's it's chaos of Josh Allen. You kind of hope he cleans those things up. But he's got to play a cleaner game against Cincinnati. And if they get to Casey, um, you know, there's really there's no room for that kind of stuff. Uh, I understand the pushing it down the field. That seems to be what they're. Plan was and, and like you said, I mean they they hit on two or three of them and they dropped two more of them, right? So I mean there was, you know they, they could have had a lot of big plays on field. They were pushing it down the field. That's fine, but you know you got to be comfortable to take what's underneath, what's there for you. Um, you've got to dink or dime move it on the field, like the Ravens did against Cincinnati last week. You know long drives, sustained drives, and that's what you're going to have to do. And you know win that way. You don't gotta you don't gotta get it all in one play basically. And and hopefully you know. Playoff Josh it, it, is different, so hopefully he, you know, we see him next week. Get his bad game out of the way now, and the next two, next two or three, hopefully, will be, uh, will be pretty good. That's the funny thing, and you're not wrong, but when you look at his stats and you're like, dude, dude for three hundred some yards and three yeah. touchdowns, it's like, but and there were way, two bombs left in the field. It could have been over four hundred yards. Yeah, like, you know? yeah. Shakir dropped fifty one yarder that was yeah. literally right in his hands, right there. Yep. It's just funny that the standard that he's held to, and rightfully so, as he should be. You know, this offense, it, it really has been the last couple of weeks, live or die. I mean, I look at the stats and 
I think Cook and Singletary had like one target between both of them for the whole game. He just was mm-hmm. not looking to check down. In fact, that one drive where a lot of people, including me, got pissed off at Ken Dorsey, they're trying to protect the lead. And I remember earlier in the game, they brought two tight ends in, sent two guys deep, and Quinton Morris was wide open for a check down, and he got like 12 yards on it. They ran that same formation, same play again. But then he went downfield, took two shots down the field to Gabe Davis. Neither of them were ended up completed. Yeah, that's the thing about like, people get mad at Dorsey about that. And I'm like, I don't know if Dorsey's calling him that or if Josh is like, oh, I got single Josh. coverage, I'm going. Like, you yeah. know, that, that's that's when you don't really know what's the first read there. You know, it's right. hard to you know know right. as a fan. Right. And and then here and then there's one other thing too that I hated for the game, and I'm concerned about going forward. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. You know how, so you cover hockey, man. And so you know how it is. You could, you got a guy like, and I'm just throwing a name out there. Let's just say Dylan Cousins, just because mm-hmm. that's the first thing that pops in my mind. You don't watch the game, but you look at the box score and you see that Dylan and the Sabres lose two to one. And the one Sabres goal was scored by Dylan Cousins. Okay. You're like, all right, well, he scored a goal. But in reality, he played a terrible game. He was in front of the net, got a lucky bounce, it went into his stick and, and bam, tapping for a goal. That's Ed Oliver to me. In a nutshell, on Sunday, he had a yeah. sack. So you look at it, you're like, oh, he had a sack. I'm going to tell you right, he was playing against a practice squad guard. Miami's offensive line was decimated with injuries. Ed Oliver, Greg Rizzo, very little in terms of pass rush anyway. I thought Skylar Thompson was too comfortable. It required the Bills, and to their credit, they did a good job of blitzing. But Teron Johnson blitzed a lot. Milano blitzed a lot. Edmonds blitzed a lot. They brought safeties in. They had to blitz a lot more than normal. And I felt like that was because, well, hey, they really wanted to get to Skylar Thompson. But also, the front four just wasn't getting it done. Now, they had four sacks. But again, they blitzed a ton. And Boogie Basham played well. Mm-hmm. But nothing really from Greg Rizzo, who's played well this year. I'm not, you know, it could have just been one of those days. But I need to see Ed Oliver play like a stud. I mean, this is a guy. And again, I don't want to get into these off-season conversations with money right now. But... His options have been picked up, but you want to talk about a long-term deal. I need to see more before this guy gets paid. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to play against uh, an injury-depleted Skylar Thompson-led offense. It's another day when you're playing against Joey Burrow. And if you can't get to him, it's going to be a long, long, long day for uh, the Buffalo Bills defense. I just, long story short here, I don't think the defensive line did a very good job outside of Boogie in terms of uh, a pass rush with just those four. No, I I completely agree. And, And look, you know, you, I think you covered a lot within the Dolphins game. Uh, looking forward to next week. Mm-hmm. If they don't get to Burrow with four or five, forget it. Yeah. Like that, especially with going into that game, it looks like it's pretty definitely going to be the Bengals are going to have three of their five starters out. Again, for a team that went 16 games with all five, and have lost one or two guys over the last couple of weeks. They're going to mm-hmm. have three of their five starters probably out. And you could tell watching that game against the Ravens, the Bengals' offense completely switched when those guys went out. When Jonah Williams went out, the left tackle, the, 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 they were they went to they the short game. Down. They yep. they were afraid to let Burrow stand back there a long time. So you have to get there with that pressure against back. You have to. You know this this is one of the games that I think is really going to suck not having Von Miller because. I, you you got to get there because if you can get there with four or five, you can then have your player, your, your secondary in your linebackers, um, you know, squat on those short routes. So they're going to try to play that game against on you. Cause I, I have a feeling and they're again, same thing. They're not going to want Bird to stand back, especially for a guy who, you know, has a tendency to hold the ball a little bit too long. Mm-hmm. Um, they're probably going to call a game where they don't want him standing back there very long, try to get it out, try to get in the hands of those playmaking receivers and see if they can make some things happen. Uh, so yeah, I mean, honestly, like I'm not one of the you know cliche football guys by any means, but I, I legitimately think next week's game, the winner is is the team that's going to have the better line play on both sides of the ball. I, I think the Bills are going to need to run the ball, and, and again, I don't say that very often, but you know, look at the Ravens did to them, uh, control the game that way. Um, you know, not not crazy, but I think they're going to have to have a good good ring, good run game going. If you look back to the you know, one drive they had against the Bengals in the one game. They they leaned on the run a lot. They they broke off a few nice runs against that sure team. Did. So I think that's going to be important. And, you know, Josh has to play a clean game. You know, it, it's still, until otherwise that game plays out, I'm still going in where it's Patrick Mahomes rules where you have to coach and play 
that you have to score every drive and, and we'll see how things start to play out. But that's absolutely my mentality going to that game where you have to score every single time and field goals count as stops. If you're a, if it were up to you, if you were a player and you cover a team, well, you cover hockey, you know, sports. Well, mm-hmm. do you think it's beneficial if you're in the playoffs and survive in advance, obviously, and that's exactly what the Buffalo Bills did. And it's exactly what the Cincinnati Bengals also did against yep, the Baltimore yep. Ravens. They could have lost that game, just like the Bills. Anyway, do you think it's beneficial to a t- for a team, especially a team that's a, a favorite, like both these teams are? They've been amongst the favorites all season long. Do you think it's better to kind of make a lot of mistakes, overcome them, overcome adversity, and, and win a tight game? Or do you think it's better to roll a team that you're way better than by three or four touchdowns? Like, I'm going back to the Miami game one more time. Yeah. or going back to that well. Do you think the Bills are better off for this week because they did not play a clean game last week? They know they got a lot of shit that they need to fix right now. Or do you think you're better off when that machine's just rolling and you go and you roll? Because like, like last year in the first round, they just destroyed the Patriots and they carried that momentum over. They played well yeah, against they, the Chiefs. They yep. should have beat the Chiefs. We all know that. Yep. You think it's better to, to come in on a roll? Or do you think it's maybe they're, they might be better off saying, you know what, man, we got a lot of ugly shit from last week. We need to clean us up. Yeah, that's hard to say. Because on one hand, like, I get it. Like, you know, you get through adversity. You're like, whoa. Like, all right. Like, look, we got lucky. We got to get our shit together. We got to play cleaner game. And, you know, mm-hmm. you have to focus on that. But then on the other hand, you know, if you're rolling, then you go into the next thing. you be like, okay, we're in our groove. We're going, you know, especially for the Bills. From the Bills standpoint, you're, okay, we went and we were rolling through New England. Our offense rolled through Kansas City. Here we come in the playoffs again. We rolled through Miami. Like, we know how to do this offensively in the playoffs. Like, let, let's go. Let's keep going. Uh, so I could see an argument on both sides. You know, I don't know which one really, you know, would go. I think right. if you ask a player, they will say we'd rather, you know, have a big game and be, like, perfect than all. You'd rather have the Patriots game sure. like, if you ask a player. And so I guess that's where I would lean if I had to decide. That's fair. All right, so this is the game we've all been waiting for, man. Fans are on, not just in Buffalo and Cincinnati. Fans are on the league, want to see this game. Two of the best teams in the NFL. Uh, The Bengals are very battle-tested. I mean, Mm -hmm. this game won't be – if they lose, it's not going to be because this moment, this game was too big for them. That might happen. I hope it doesn't. That might happen in Jacksonville next week when they go to Kansas City. That game, that moment might be a little bit too big for them. We'll wait wait to see. But, like, this game definitely ain't going to be too big for the Bengals. Like I said, they're battle-tested. They're the defending AFC champions. They won nine straight games, including the last week's playoff game. They won 11 of their last 12. Um, five of their nine wins have been one-score games. So they've blown teams out. They've won close games. Uh, and dating back to the first game, which, again, you got, what, nine minutes of action or whatever. Yeah. Can't take too much on that. But I'll tell you, the one thing that did stick out for me before the DeMar Hamlin um, incident happened was, and who knows how the game would have played out, but what I, what I do know is Cincinnati came out of that game very aggressive and confident. I mean, they take – you know how it is in the NFL. You win the toss, you defer, right? Yep. The Bengals wanted the ball. They won the toss. They took the ball. They said, F this, man. We're going right down. We're going to go score. up 7 yep. nothing." And that's literally what they did. Uh, they were, and they also, um, Jamar Chase right away went at Trey White, which I still kind of, that haunts me a little bit, the, yeah. those couple of plays. And I'm like, shit, man, this team is uh, really, really good. I think there's two keys to this game. You hit on one of them, uh, line play, obviously. You got to get to Joe Burrow. Even if you don't get him on the ground, you got to get this guy uncomfortable. You got to get him getting rid of the ball earlier than he wants. Get him on the move, having to make plays on the run. And then obviously, you just you cannot. If the Bills turn the ball over three times, I, I think no. that's a wrap for the season. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, man, it, it, it's a it's a toss. I do like the Bills, and I'm not saying that as a homer. I really do. I think having the home field and an opportunity to prepare. But I'll tell you this. They got to find a way in the secondary, Chad, to to get some kind of help because I could just see this being the kind of game, like much like you were at that Minnesota game this year. So you saw it with your own eyes. Yeah. And they just go at Justin Jefferson and feed him, feed him, feed him, feed him. Yeah. You might see that with uh with Chase. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, early last week when Hyde was practicing, I'm like, oh, awesome, he's in the play for the Bengals game. Like, (laughs) all right, we're gonna have our safeties back. We'll be fine. Not fine, but but we're gonna be in a good spot. And then. Later in the week, you know, McDermott plays. Oh well, he's not going to play next week either. Like, oh, well, shit, there goes that. Uh, so, um, yeah, I 
yeah, I, Dean Milo is a safety. You know, I, I know he had an interception, but it was also funny slash scary that he said he was actually in the wrong spot when he made the interception. Like he, he was trying yeah, to run was back where he was supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. I respect the honesty too from yeah. him, from Dean. <laughs> yeah. So that makes you a little bit nervous. So, uh, yeah, because the, again, those two receivers, three receivers, I'm sorry. Um, you know, they, they're three number ones on that team. So I, you know, you know, you're going to have to have your guys be up for it. Uh, you know, Trey played speed guys and, and held his own this past week. But again, that's Skylar Thompson. That's not Joe Burrow. Um, and he's probably going to see Chase again. And then you just got to hope, you know, whoever's on the other side is ready for it. And, you know, Taryn, I, I feel like, you know, I, I have confidence that he'll be fine. He's not going to be perfect every play. But, yeah, you're going to need a place. And, and, you know, and, and while we're talking about receivers, don't forget, I mean, they have two running backs who are pretty good, too. Very you good. fall asleep on them. They they can make your day pretty miserable as well. Yeah, they like I said, the Bills have to win. I think you said it perfect. That whoever wins the line of scrimmage and a game which is funny because this is a game full of star players, you know, on both yeah. sides of the ball for both teams. And we're talking about the trenches ultimately being uh what might win this game for the Bills. The one thing, uh, there's two things that I think the Bills very much have going for them. Obviously, one of them is the home field advantage, which I do yep. think matters. 100% with the crowd. Yep. And then the other thing, and we talked about this a little bit, Cincinnati, if you want to know the effect of what having three starting linemen out, and by the way, this is these aren't three injuries that happened early in the season and they've had time to kind of overcome this and you know put together a new line. These have been like three injuries over the last three full football games that they've played now. Yep. Um, I don't know, by the way, as, as we tape this officially, anyway, Kappa has not been ruled out, and, and neither has Jonah Williams, although I think it was revealed today as a, like a dislocated kneecap. Dislocated kneecap, it, and yeah, he said, they're, he said they're week to week is what Taylor said. Yeah, I don't see how that happens that they play. But anyway, from if, if, you, if you're thinking about it from a Buffalo Bills perspective and you want to know how that would affect your offense, well, think of Deion Dawkins, Ryan Bates, and, and Spencer Brown all being out this week, yeah. potentially. You know what I mean? And having to play Ike Bakker and – Bobby Hart and, and, and Quisenberry. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? It, there's there's opportunity there to uh, really make life hell for Burrow. And um, although he, in some ways he's kind of used to it. But again, there was a lot of opportunity for that with Miami. And, yeah. and it required a lot of blitzing. And I just don't think that's going to work because the quarterback is just a million times better uh, than Skylar Thompson. Anyway, let's switch gears here for a few minutes where we go. Uh, so the Sabres. Again, mm-hmm. we're taping this Monday night. Uh, Monday was the start of an important, I thought anyway, important hockey week for, for the Sabres. Yep. So you had Florida coming in on Monday afternoon. Well, I believe the Sabres were tied for points coming into that game. They were the same. The Sabres had a game in hand, so, but yeah, they were tied in points. Right. Um, so you got that. And then tonight, well, tonight now, Tuesday, next people listen to us on Tuesday. There are Chicago is the worst team in the yep. league. An opportunity to get two points there. And then, uh, then they play Islanders later this week, a team that they're trying to chase down for, uh, you know, the second wild card spot. If Ryan Miller also- night too. Hmm? Ryan Miller night too on Thursday. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Ryan Miller night too. So, yeah, a huge week for the Sabres. Yeah. Anyway, all right, well, Monday afternoon, not a good start, man. No. They lose to the Florida uh, Panthers 4-1 to one empty net goal at the end. Um, This is a game, for, and I watched most of it anyway. It just it never felt in doubt for Florida. You know what I mean? It wasn't. It was a game that yeah. it always felt like Florida was up comfortably. I don't know what it was with the Sabres. They were passing the puck a lot. Like, they were giving up some good shots, trying to create great shots. Uh, they were down 3 nothing before an Alex Tuck goal uh, broke the shutout. Just kind of, I don't know, talk about this dud of a a Monday game. What's going on with the Sabres, man, lately? Losers, not what, but like four out of their last five. Four out of the last five, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I will say this game wasn't as bad as last Monday against the Flyers. Um, so uh, you can take something from that if you want. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's you know, I mean, there is maybe about I would say 10, like maybe like maybe like the end of the first period. Uh, is I felt they were kind of they were, they were going, um, Florida fed into what they want to do and, and were fine to play an up and down kind of game. That's what the Sabres want to do too. Um, and the Panthers came out in the second period and basically said enough of that. Um, we're just going to claw the neutral zone. Like a lot of teams have figured out what to, to do that to them. Um, and we're going to either you have to make good passes or we're going to cause turnovers here. Um, and, and and then we're going to, you know, counterattack you. And then that's what happened. And 
they never really recovered from that standpoint. Uh, they didn't generate a lot of offense, which is not really their style. Um, they're pretty good at doing that this season. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I get what people are saying. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh. I'm watching the Cowboys game and, and the kicker literally just missed his fourth extra point of the game. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to focus when you can't, when you, when your kicker can't make an extra point, how are we supposed to be able to talk Sabres hockey when a <laughs> Dallas Cowboys kicker can't kick the goddamn ball in them for an extra point. Fourth in a row. Insane. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. That is. Back to the Sabres. But yeah, that I was smiling as I was talking on the people in the why because I was <laughs> it's fantastic. Um I was like, all right, are you sadistically evil or something? And you're taking uh you're taking some humor and then the Sabres playing like shit today, but no. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, so they'll they'll you know they'll have to kind of figure it out. I mean, the, the good news is you get right back at it tomorrow. Uh you go to Chicago. Um and that's a really bad team. They're not going to have Patrick Kane, which actually might be a good thing for them with how poor Patrick Kane's played this year. But um, he's going to be out, and he just that's that's a game you got to have. Um, you know, Chicago's not an easy place to go play, so it used to not be. Right. Um, but you got to have that game. No excuses. Uh, and then Thursday is a is, Thursday's a big game, not only because the Miller thing, but that is literally the team you are chasing in the playoffs race. Uh, yeah. You got to have it. Um, the unfortunate part, uh, is, you know, with, with their recent scoring rows, if you will, uh, the only reason the Islanders are where they are is because they have Ilya Sorokin, who is probably going to win the Vesna this year. Um, I think I saw a thing today, like he, he has like a nine, like a nine, five, seven save percentage and a 1.83 goals against average, something like that. Wow. Uh, but in that stretch, he's like, and it's a 10 game stretch. He's five, four and one. So that kind of gives you like the Islanders, like how like literally reliant they are on him. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you can get a couple goals on, on him and, you know, Islanders don't score a lot of goals, you should be in good shape. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the Islanders and they play that type of game that will law you to sleep. So um, those games are never fun. But that's a big game. And then Saturday's Anaheim. I mean, again, another bad team. So really, like, you got to – I you got to have these next three, I think. Um I, I just don't see any way around it. If you're going to only take, if it's going to be the same thing as last week, where you take one out of the four games, um, that's going to completely bury You're going to be in trouble. Yeah. They're, Cause you go on, cause next them, week right? you go on the road and you, then you play Dallas. Who's playing really good. There's a, and I think Minnesota again. Um, yeah. So you got a lot of home games here and if you keep dropping them, it, it's going to be hard when you go on the road, which is, it's crazy because when they go out West, they actually do well, but, um, I'm not going to have a lot of confidence, you know, going to play four games and uh, six nights, you know, from, from a lot of you know pretty good teams out there at West. So they, they, they got to finish strong the rest of this week. Let me pull up a tweet from uh, Joe Yurden. Like I said, the, the guy I usually do the show with on Tuesdays, he was at the game, covered the game today. And, and he said, uh, he tweeted this afterwards. Granado chalked up uh, today's game as guys not being emotionally into the game. He made it a point to say Kyle Oso was the one guy who was everyone else was not. Is that an anomaly? I feel I I would I hope that's an anomaly right now because uh I mean the the effort just not being there in a game that is meaningful. I mean they're all meaningful when you're trying to you know get in a playoff race here, but Florida directly I, I mean that's not a very uh, it's not a promising thing to, to to read. Yeah. Yeah, it's Yeah. It's tough. You know, I, I don't want to say that nobody wasn't in that game emotionally because I, besides the post, I feel like Alex Tuck had a really good game and there was a couple of the guys that were going to, but yeah, I get it. Um, you know, it's, it's still a young team uh, mm-hmm. in Florida. Florida's having a rough year, but it's a bunch of guys who have been there. Uh, you know, they, they had a hundred and something points last year. Um you know, there's a lot of talent, you know, on that, a lot of talent on that team, um, which makes it kind of crazy to think about how they're, you know, they're tied with the Sabres going into today. Um, but yeah, Florida was just up for it. Uh, they came in here, they played their game, the, their big guys had a good night. Um, you know, we got a vintage Sam Reinhardt pass for that third goal, you know, in the two on one. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it, it there, there might be times you know, throughout this season and throughout the next couple of months here where there's big opportunities and, and this young team just isn't up for it yet. And then that's a, that's a learning thing, but that's why I think these games are important. 
uh, to be in this race, to, to play these games uh, that are meaningful and big and, and, and understand, you know, kind of that energy that goes into it, the way teams take these games, you know, once the calendar flips to like, you know, we're in January here, these, these games become more important. The games are played differently. They're played tighter. There's more to them. Uh, they, they, they mean more. So it's not the same type of game you're going to get in October, November here in January, February. So we'll see if they're up for it. Um, you know, just just be in the race is all is all I really wanted this season, and and so far so good. And you know, hopefully at least they kind of make things fun, interesting around here for at least another month or two. One more question, then I'll let you go. We got a fourth quarter here to watch of a uh, vital wild card game of, of the week. It's hard to reject right now, so I know that I'm asking you kind of an unfair question. But mm-hmm. how the hell do you see this uh, goaltending situation playing oh. out right now? That's going on with Buffalo. Are they just going to keep doing paper transactions? multiple times per week until I don't know, one of these three goalies ultimately gets hurt. And then a decision is made for you. I mean, how, how's this playing out? I, I think I saw, I don't know if it was a direct quote or it was an insinuation maybe from Granado that UPL is the, the number one guy right yeah, now. Yeah. I was going to say that. Yeah. He, today was kind of the first time that he picked the lane essentially. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Um, basically what he said, if, if all three goalies are ready to go that right now, Luke, is the guy. All right. Well, go. how do you how do you see this playing out with these paper transactions? They keep it off all three guys. I mean, so I think you can only do it for so long, right? Right. This week they can get by. They'll do what they did last week. Lukanen won't play tomorrow, uh, so he will be sent back to Rochester. Sent back, quote unquote. So it'll be another paper transaction. Uh, Peyton Krabs will come back up. He'll probably play tomorrow, uh, and then so that'll you know we'll see if it's Comrie or Anderson tomorrow. I'm actually pretty curious to see which way Granado goes there. Um, if it was me, because I feel like you kind of need to get Comrie going, uh, that you would play him against Chicago. But at the same time, if you have more confidence in Anderson and you really need that game, maybe it's Anderson who's in goal. So I- I'm curious to see where Granado goes on who's going to play tomorrow. Uh, and then Thursday, he'll come back up. And that might be the first interesting decision one. Because then you've gone through all of your waiver exempt kids, if you will. You've sent Quinn down, you've sent Paterka down, you've sent Krebs down for the. You're not only to do these two game sits kind of thing, like they sit out for two games kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't have any injuries at that point, then what is he going to do? Does he start the cycle again? Is it then okay? Then Quinn went out for two games, then he'll come back up, and then Paterka's going out for two games. He'll come like is that his plan? We're going to cycle through these three. And kind of as long as we can here because they're waiver exempt. Or what do you think of that plan? Let's just assume that goes on longer. What do, what do you think of this plan? I don't like that. Um, I understood it, and I was even an advocate for sitting down Quinn and Paterka, especially after the Flyers game. I they just didn't have it. Uh, the, the legs weren't there. They were overthinking it. Um, poor play for a couple of games going to that. So I was fine giving them a couple of games off to kind of you know get you know get back together and get their legs under them. That's fine. You know, you're trying to get used to, uh, you know, an 82 game season as as a 19 year old kid. I can understand it. Um, But you also need them in your lineup. You know, that team was not the same without them. Um, They struggled to generate offensively because, you know, those those guys, Hennestros and Asplund really can't play with cousins on on that line that are vacated by Quinn and Paterka. Um, Now, the two didn't have a great game today that line in general but no off off of nashville when they were fantastic and they thought the kid line was back they had their struggles today which you know can happen against a veteran florida team but yeah i don't know i didn't love the idea of taking krebs out um i thought he was playing well but yeah i don't know i I think you're gonna have to make a decision here at at some point you're gonna have to make a move if you don't i I don't know if they're spooked from losing casey fitzgerald on waivers they don't want to lose somebody else and and, you know being aspen or hinnestroza but if that's the case, I feel like someone will give you an asset for it. So, you know, call and see if you can get, even if it's a late round pick for one of them or, or make a decision on your goaltenders. Um, you know, you could waive Comrie. I don't think they will. And I don't think that's the best decision, but you know, Alex Adelkovich from the Red Wings, um, you know, went through waivers uh, yesterday and cleared today. So maybe that's a sign that, if you really wanted to try to sneak Comrie through, you could. Now, Nadelkovic makes more money. Maybe that's why he he did clear. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what he does here after um, 
you know, tomorrow's game because it feels like you might have to make a decision again, or maybe he'll just start the carousel and, and keep sending the young players down. Before I let you go too, there's always new people who are discovering this podcast. And for some of them, at least mainly, you know, hardcore Buffalo Bills fans who are more casual Sabre fans, but, are, yeah. you know, the team's kind of growing on them and who aren't familiar that much with you and your work. Tell uh, people listening and watching just for a minute here a little bit about what you guys offer over at uh, Expected Buffalo. Yeah, so we're a, uh, so we cover the Sabres, obviously. Um, we look at it um, – you know, from a uh, analytics, you know, more of a fancy stats side, if you will. Uh, we're, we're we're statistics guys. Uh, there's myself, there's Anthony and Eddie. Uh, we're the three main writers on that site. Um, and yeah, you know, we just cover the team from that. Now, not everything is is you know heavily statistics based, but that's kind of what we do. Uh, one of the cool things we have coming up, which I'm actually going to record right after we finish here. Um, you know, it, it came off of the whole Mike Harrington thing, you know, about a month ago um off of that is what mm-hmm. i wanted to do is put you know because thinking about it reflecting on that um i realized that what we do is confusing and is difficult to understand uh so what i'm going to be doing the first one will be tonight and I'll, I'll put it out tonight for people to look watch tomorrow um it's kind of we're going to put out these things where it's kind of a, a talk through we're going to talk through the stats what, what they mean so we're going to talk through what Corsi means what fenwick means how they're used uh in some no statistical areas we're going to talk about. We're going to show how you see it on the ice. How do you see an expected goal? What does it mean? Um, how do you see this micro stat? How do you see a shot attempt? You know, how is it determined and all of that fun stuff. So we're going to talk about them. I'll talk it through. Um, we'll go over some definitions, what they mean, how it reflects on the ice, what it fill, feeds into. And then we'll go over some video to show you kind of how with your eyes, you can see that as you're watching the game. So I'm excited to get that series going. Um, yeah, I think it'll help, and I think it'll help interaction. And, and you know, we all want smarter fans around here. So, you know, if you're not a big stats guy, that's fine. But maybe this will kind of open your eyes if you're someone absolutely that wants to learn. I ain't gonna lie to you, man. I'm really looking forward to that because I, <laughs> I'm, I don't understand these stats, but I very much want to learn. And maybe having an explanation and, and videos and stuff would absolutely uh, do the trick. All right, everyone, make sure you follow Chad on Twitter at CMD Dominicis. Check out expectedbuffalo.com. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, whether you're on the video side, the audio side. Again, kind of short notice, and it also it is late on Monday night, so I appreciate you as always, Chad, man. Always good having you on the show, buddy. Anytime, Pat, anytime. All right, guys, take care, and I'll be back with a new episode. Aaron Quinn, Casual Friday, and we will have a full Buffalo Bills Cincinnati Bengals preview. Talk to you then.